All right, well, our text this morning, um, I, I choose Matthew 6, verse 24, but um, really, as, I'm th as I was thinking about this and as the sermon was developing, I, I think I found a text that might uh, better fit what it is we're looking at because it contains the principle we're looking at, but let me read this one anyway. Jesus says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Actually, you cannot serve God and anything else. Okay? There, there's to be nothing even close, not even a close second. And you can see how this fits with the, uh, the text that I had actually chosen earlier where we, if we're going to follow Jesus, we have to love him most of all. Even our closest relations have to be a far distant second. Okay? Well, that's what this expresses. We need to have ultimate love for the Lord. But the question we're really pursuing uh, this, this morning is how can we grow in this love? How can we have more of this love? And really, I'm going to make reference to it later. I don't have the reference in front of me right now, but it's in James. I believe it's in James 4, where, it's, it, where James says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So this is the thesis that I'm, I'm really pursuing this morning is this. God, God sovereignly gives to us his Holy Spirit. You know, through the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ when he causes us to be born again, okay? The Spirit of God creates that love in our heart that allows us to pursue God, to draw near to him. But the one thing that we maybe overlook, I think I have in many ways, is that as we draw near to him, he draws near to us. And if we put that together with really what it, what it is that creates this love in our hearts, it really is the nearness of God that does it. When God is far, we don't love him as much. But when he's near, we love him more strongly. Now, maybe these things all resolve to the same thing as just being filled with the Holy Spirit, but I just want to pursue it in, in these terms this morning. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. So as I've said this morning, we are concluding this study. And I wanted to begin with a bird's eye review of what we've looked at, okay? So just real quickly to note these things, we started the series by um, just thinking about this, okay? If we are to love God, we really do have to believe there is a God to love, right? We have to believe that he is. As the author to the Hebrews reminds us, he who comes to God must believe that he is. So that's one of the reasons why we you know, went to such a, you know, lengths to uh, go through apologetics and various things of that nature because it does convince us of the truth of God's existence. Now, we do have the more sure word of prophecy. We have the word of God. We have all the miracles of Christ. And, you know, as God's spokesman, he tells us that God exists. But I, again, remember R.C. Sproul. As he reminds us, for there to be a word of God, there must be a God. The evidence is all around us. He exists. Okay. Secondly, we need to believe that the Bible is his word, that we really have a source of infallible information about God. And we had to have these two convictions at the very beginning, because if we aren't convinced of those two things, we're really not going to make any progress in our love for the Lord. Well, having you know, established those two things, we then delved into the word of God to see how much love that the Father has for us, okay, infinite love that he has shown us, his choosing us in eternity, and that in spite of what he foresaw we would be, which are all sinners, hate him, running away from him. And in this condition, while we were still his enemies, sending his son into the world to live the life we failed to live, to die on the cross, to atone for our transgressions, and then to be raised for us, and again, remember, he did this while we were still hating him, while we were still his enemies. The Father sent him to be our mediator, our prophet, to declare the, the will of God for our salvation, uh, our priest, of course, to make this atonement, and our king to subdue us and to rule over us in order that he might redeem us to himself and that we might be delivered from an eternity of suffering without God first loving us, we would have suffered in hell, a very real place, the Bible tells us, forever without any possibility of, of, of getting out of there, okay? 
Now we saw the other blessings that he's given to us. He's promised to work all things together for our good. All of our circumstances in life to help us on our way to heaven. He's promised to answer our prayers that we may ask for whatever we need and know he will answer us. And of course he wants us to have what we need so we can do what he calls us to do in this world. And again, just a reminder, God doesn't bless us with all the things we have just so we can have an easy life, just so we can, you know, make this pleasure planet, right? He gives us these things so that we might serve him. It's a stewardship. Uh, and we need to remember that. We belong to him. We need to be pursuing him. Not that recreation is bad, okay? Recreation is good. We need so much recreation. But life is not just recreation. Life is the pursuit of God and his kingdom and giving him glory. Uh, the Lord will acquit us on the day of his judgments because of Christ's righteousness and his forgiveness will be presented blameless in Christ on that day. And then he will bless us with the eternal inheritance in the new heavens and the new earth where we will live with the Lord forever. Okay, these are all expressions of his infinite love. So we would say this, God has given to us a gift of infinite worth I remember what uh, Jonathan Edwards said on one occasion, how the wicked who are in hell right now, they would give the world, they would give everything else that they could possibly give if they possessed it. And we might even add to that the wealth of the universe. Now he said, just to reduce the penalty of their sins by one, because every sin that an unbeliever commits increases his judgment in hell. Well, think about this. All the wealth of the entire world, of the entire universe, could not have possibly been enough to purchase what God has freely given to us in the Lord Jesus Christ, the free gift. So how much should we love him? Well, the only answerable love to that is to love him most of all, with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. So we should love him because of what he's done for us, but we realize that's not the main reason. The main reason is because of who he is, and his love is an expression of who he is. His love for holiness, his grace, his mercy, all of these things. Now, then we looked at how we are to love him, and we are to love him the way Jesus loved him. And again, consider how Jesus kept all the commandments. And again, we need to be reminded, let's not forget, because we tend to forget. But Jesus put his father first devoted his life to him. That's what we are to be doing. We need to give our whole selves to him, to worship him, to serve him. Remember, worship is not just what we do on Sundays, but worship is, is how we live. Our whole lives are to be offered to him as living sacrifices, our uh, acceptable service of worship, Paul tells us. We need to keep our promises to him, especially those that we made when we uh, took up, as it were, the mantle or took up our crosses to follow after Christ. And we need to set his holy day aside to worship him and to seek him. And I tell you, if we don't do that, we're going to be in pretty dire straits when it comes to growing in love for him because we need these ways to pursue him. We need to draw near to him in this way if he is to draw near to us and we are to be strengthened. We're also to love those, uh, or I should say, to love him by loving those who are made in his image, by honoring the authority that he's ordained in the various spheres of life. Uh, we know government, church, family, um, in as much as it doesn't contradict his, of course. They, it has to be within their God-given bounds. We need to protect our own and our neighbor's life, purity, property, and reputation and be content with how the Lord has made us and what the Lord has made us and with the things that he's given us in life. Boy, that would um, really eliminate majority of, of just crime and wickedness in this world if even that last commandment could be obeyed uh, by the world. But again, these are the things that the Lord calls us to do. These are the things he gives us a love for. These are the things that define love. And they define Christ. This is the life he lived. And again, we are to become like him. But again, seeing why we are to love him, God's infinite love, how we are to love him as Christ has loved him, does not mean that we will love him. You know, 
even if we just go through the motions of doing what Jesus did, that still is not loving God. That's not the kind of love God wants. It has to come from the heart. There has to be these holy affections that are directed towards him and his glory and his honor. Otherwise, we will not please him. Think about what Paul writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 3. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, if I become a martyr for God's cause, for Christ's cause, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Notice Paul used the ultimate sacrifice of giving one's life. You can do that, you know, but if you don't love God, it's going to be meaningless to him. So the question that we're looking at this morning is this, how can we have a stronger love for God? Now, obviously, for Christians, we love him. But we're asking the question, how can we have a stronger love? Because God wants our love to grow. He wants it to be like Christ. The more love we have, the more we'll do for him. The more we'll honor him. He's, he's really bound us by, again, his infinite grace to love him. So how can we love him? Well, to understand how, I'm going to go back to basics just for a few moments. We do need to remember where this love comes from in the first place. I've already told you from the Holy Spirit in his work of the new birth. Now, going back to the very beginning, I think we need to understand this. Otherwise, we're not going to understand how this works. When God originally made Adam and Eve, he gave them his Holy Spirit. Okay? That was, or I should say, the Spirit was their original righteousness. And original righteousness means the origin of all their right acts, of all the good things they did. It was love for God that God gave to them. But this is what they lost in the fall. When they disobeyed God, the Spirit withdrew. And that's what made Adam and Eve, again, feel like or sense like this loss of something made them feel naked, okay? It's not that their eyes were opened and suddenly they realized they had no clothes, okay? It's not that they didn't understand that before. They knew that, but they did feel vulnerable. And that vulnerability came from two things, really the loss of the Spirit and the fact that they fell under God's condemnation. But when they lost the Spirit, they no longer loved Him. They were no longer like him, okay? Now, they still had the image of God, the natural image of God. Uh, you know, even after the fall, when the Lord is telling Noah, you know, that whoever kills man, whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed because in the image of God, he made man. And James reminds us of the same thing. Man is still in the image of God. He, he still has what's called the natural image of God, which is, you know, he's a person, he has intelligence, he has imagination, he has will, he can will things. He's still spiritual as well as physical. And he is immortal. And he has a moral capacity. So in those ways, man is still like God, but man no longer loves God, no longer loves like God, no longer loves what God loves. He no longer loves what is good. So notice, instead of running towards God, which is what Adam and Eve would do in the garden when God would come down in the cool of the evening in order to have fellowship with them, instead of running towards him, they, when they heard him, they, they ran away from him and they hid themselves in the garden because they were afraid of him. And if we believe the theology of Scripture, which we, of course, must, they hated him as well. And they were afraid of him and his judgment. Okay, so notice, when they had the Spirit... They drew near to him. When they didn't have the Spirit, they ran away from him because they hated him. But we should also notice this. God redeemed them. Okay, God redeemed Adam and Eve. The work of Christ on the cross many thousands of years forward. And let's see, how many years would that be? Roughly, what, 4,000 years? Okay, I'm early, I believe in a young earth. Um, that work on the cross was applied backwards to Adam and Eve. Okay, it stretched back to the beginning, even as it stretches from the cross forward to us and even will to the end of the world. And because of that, God was able to give them his spirit again. Okay? But it wasn't like before. They loved God, but imperfectly. And why? Well, we say because they had this other principle of 
sin in them, but again, we're going to look and see kind of what that actually is. They just didn't have the Spirit in the same degree that they had Him before, okay? Now, the same thing is true of us, okay? This, what, what we, this description of Adam and Eve also describes us. We came into the world just like Adam and Eve after the fall, right? We came into the world hating God because we didn't have the Spirit. But when the Spirit made us alive, when He caused us to be born again, when we were regenerated by the Spirit, we began to love Him <clears throat> for the very first time in our lives, but very imperfectly. Okay, and then we began to draw near to God. So what Adam and Eve experienced, okay, what we also have experienced in our own lives really helps us to understand what evil is, okay, what evil is. And there's different explanations for this, different ways of viewing it. But I think this is really what it is, okay. Adam and Eve were good. They loved God and they sought after Him when they had the Spirit. But when they disobeyed and lost the Spirit, then they hated Him, then they feared Him. Okay, so what is evil? Well, evil is really, as we said before, the absence of good. And good is God. Okay, God is the good. When God is near, then that creature is good. When God is far, that creature is evil. Now, we know that God created all things, right? We know that whatever exists... God must have created it because he's the only one that has creative power. So if evil really was a thing that somehow spontaneously generated in the hearts of Adam and Eve, uh, if it was a created thing, we'd have a problem there, wouldn't we? Because we'd have to say, well, God had to have made it because he is the author of all things. But we do know from Scripture that he is not the creator of evil. He's not the author of it. So evil, we need to think of it in these terms. Evil was not the presence of something new in the hearts of Adam and Eve. It was really a new disposition in their hearts, a disposition against God. Okay, we might say in a sense, evil does not really have existence. It doesn't have independent existence. It's not a thing. It is an inclination of the heart, okay, that is caused by the absence of the Holy Spirit. Now, you remember this analogy? What is darkness? Is darkness a thing, you know? No, darkness is really the absence of light. Okay, what is cold? Well, cold isn't a thing either. Cold is the absence of heat. And in the same way, evil is the absence of good or the absence of God, the absence of the Holy Spirit. Those who hate God, they hate Him because they don't have the Spirit. Those who love Him, they love Him because they have the Spirit in their souls. Now, when the, when the Lord regenerated us by the Holy Spirit, he, he opened our eyes. He showed us the beauty of God. He took away the blinders. He inclined our souls toward what is truly lovely, okay, so that we loved Him and we began to seek after Him. And think about this in terms of our Lord Jesus Christ. Think about His life. You know, we, what, is it, what is it that made the Lord love his father so much. Well, if I, when I ask that question, you know the first thing that you're going to say is this. He's the son of God, right? He's not just a man, but the person, the personality of that man is a divine being. And this divine being as the son of God has forever loved the father with a perfect love. And of course, that person is going to continue to do so in our nature. But how is it that his nature was so sanctified and so free from this, this corruption, this evil that we have to struggle with in our own lives, okay? Well, in his human nature, remember the Spirit's work, how he was conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary. Now, that did two things. First of all, because Jesus didn't have an earthly father, um, but a heavenly one, Adam's sin was not imputed to him, which means that that corruption would also not be His. He would be born with the Spirit. The Spirit of God perfectly sanctified His human nature in the womb of the Virgin, so He had absolutely no inclination towards evil, and He was wholly inclined towards God. But remember, too, what happened when Jesus began His ministry, how the Spirit of God anointed Him above measure, 
to give him not only the ability to teach and to preach and to do these miracles, but he also filled his heart with his perfect love. And then, of course, Jesus, having completed that work, has the Spirit now to give to us. So Jesus loved his Father with all his heart and sought after him. And as he did, the Father drew near to him. And we read about this in Scripture. Sometimes it's hard to untangle the work of the Trinity. You know, when the Spirit of God dwells in you, Christ dwells in you. When the Spirit of God dwells in you or Christ dwells in you, the Father dwells in you as well. The triune God dwells in you if you have the Spirit of God. So sometimes it's hard to untangle this, but we do see in the life of Christ that Jesus, as he's anointed with the Holy Spirit, also speaks about the Father being with him. He says in John 16, 32, Behold, an hour is coming and already, has already come for you to be scattered, each to his own home, and to leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. We know the Father was with Christ throughout his entire life, throughout his entire ministry, although he did depart on the cross when Jesus became our sin bearer. But we also read about the Father being in Christ. You know, he's anointed with the Spirit. He is the temple of the Holy Spirit in his human nature. The Spirit dwells in him, but also, of course, the Son is the personality, but the, the Father as well. In John 14, 11, Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. So the Spirit filled Jesus with love for the Father. And it made him draw near to the Father perfectly, with the result that the Father drew near to him. And all of this simply increases, if, if it's possible, or, or gives Jesus the superlative love that he has for the Father. So the point is this, the nearer God is to us, the more we will love him. Okay, that, that's really the point I'm trying to make. So if we're going to ask the question, how can we love him more? then we have to answer it in this way. Well, we've already seen that the further God is from us, the further the Spirit is from us, the less we will love God. But the closer He is to us, the more we will love Him. So if we want to love Him more, we do need Him to draw nearer to us. But the question is, how do we get God to draw near to us? Well, I've already answered that question, but I hope you can answer it now, okay? Now, it's true that God might do this sovereignly, okay? There are times in history when God draws near to society. When he pours out his Holy Spirit in revival, that's God drawing near. And when God draws near, people begin to seek him. Those who know him begin to love him more, right? So we see true religion, we see it working out in the hearts of God's people, but we see more of it when God draws near in revival. And sometimes he does that sovereignly. And when he does that, sometimes individually, sometimes God will draw near to us in order to strengthen us. And you wonder, why, why do I feel like, like my love for the Lord is so strong right now? And then you run into something that day where you needed that strength, you needed that love, you needed that extra ability to do what God was going to have you to do. Well, that happens, okay? Uh, but that's not how it ordinarily happens. More often than not, we need to draw near to God, okay? That's what, again, James writes in James 4, verse 8, draw near to God, and He will draw near to you, okay? That's working out your salvation with fear and trembling. How can you love Him more, pursue Him more? Well, how can we draw near to Him? Well, I think we know the answer to that. But James answers it first in that same verse by saying this, Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Well, for, that tells us, first of all, that if we're involved in sin, we do need to repent because we're going the wrong direction, right? We're running away from Him. But we need to turn and go towards Him. And again, let me ask you this question. When you fall into sin, I don't want to ask for a show of hands, but how many of you don't fall into sin, right? I mean, we all fall into sin from time to time. But when you fall into sin, how does that make you feel? As far as your love towards God, your closeness to God, your desire to pursue God, doesn't it cool off? Doesn't it diminish? 
It's the reason is, is because you are withdrawing from him, and as you're withdrawing from him, he withdraws from you. It grieves the spirit, quenches the spirit. You're not, we're not pursuing him the way we should anymore. So it has that effect. We need to, first of all, repent of every sin. By the way, I should also mention sin is not just doing the wrong things, right? Sin is not doing the right things. And if there's something right that we know God calls us to do, and we don't do it, we're going the wrong way. We're withdrawing from him. And that is quenching God's love or the love we have for him, which is the Spirit's work in our hearts. Well, having turned from our sins, we need to seek the Lord. We need to draw near to Him. We need to, if I can use the, the common um, you know, the term that's used today, press into Him. Okay, how do we do that? Well, we have to do it through the ways that God has given us to do it. We call them the means of grace, right? And, and they're mainly the word and prayer and gathering together for worship, where we do all the things that he calls us to do, these are the ways that we draw near to God. Now, what's going to happen if you don't use those things? Go day after day without touching them, without seeking the Lord. You're going the wrong way, okay? You're, you're withdrawing from the Lord. You're not pursuing him and drawing nearer, and so that love is cooling off. So we need to use these means. We need to use the word. As I mentioned before, if, if the Bible that you have sits on your table or if it's on your shelf and it never gets taken down or maybe it remains on an unopened app on your phone or your, your tablet, I mean, some of us read the Bible on, uh, you know, electronically, that's perfectly fine. But if you don't use it, if you don't open it, okay, it's not going to do you any good. We have to, as Augustine, remember, heard coming across the wall and that, that famous story of how he was converted. That child's story, take up and read. And so he took the scriptures that he had and he read. And the passage he read, the Lord used to convert him. It doesn't do you any good if you don't read it. We need to read the Bible, okay? But even reading it isn't enough. We need to make sure we understand it. We need to make sure we, we seek to know who God is through it, come to understand him. We need to pray that the Spirit of God would open our eyes to the beauty of what it is we're reading. We need to meditate on those things. We need to receive what we understand to be God's will and everything that he teaches us in the word. We need to remember it. But again, if, you stock, if we stock our heads with knowledge only and we never take that knowledge and put it into practice, we're only making ourselves, well, what we're doing is we're running further from the Lord, aren't we? Because the more we know of what he calls us to do and the less we do it, the more we're grieving the Holy Spirit, okay? So we need to put into practice what we, what we read, what we had come to understand. You see, if we don't do that, why are we reading the Bible at all? That's the reason why God wants us to read it, is so that by His Holy Spirit, it will transform us into the image of God. Okay, so we need to read it and do what it says. And if we do that, okay, if we read it, if we put it into practice, He will draw near to us. But again, if we don't, if we don't do what it says, we're going the wrong direction, that's only going to grieve and quench the Spirit. Now, we also need to pray. And again, I would commend to you the Lord's Prayer as a helpful guide. Oftentimes, we miss the point of that first petition. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Yeah, Lord, make the nations worship you, <laughs> you know. Um, spread, spread the gospel in the kingdom of heaven, but... Remember that this also applies to us, right? If your name is to be hallowed, I need to be one, the one doing that, okay? I need to love you. I need to honor you. So we need to pray that we might grow in this love and this desire to, to honor him and to share the gospel with other people so that they also would come to honor and give glory to him. And when we pray that God might provide for us and heal us and give us you know, our daily bread, what are we asking for except that God would give to us the, the physical health and strength we need to be able to carry out what it is he's called us to do in the kingdom of heaven, which is simply being a part of the great commission. And then, of course, we pray he would forgive our failures so that we might draw near to him again and help us to overcome 
every sin that stands in our way because every single one of them will weaken us. So again, if we draw near to the Lord in prayer, He will draw near to us. But if we don't, He will withdraw. Have you ever gone through a week where you haven't prayed? If you have, then you know at the end of that week, you feel further from the Lord than you do if, if you had prayed through that week. We need to pray and seek the Lord daily. Sanctification doesn't happen automatically. We need to put effort into it. And, of course, we need faithfully to worship Him on His day. Why has the Lord given us this day? It isn't to come and hear a sermon and then not let that sermon affect you, okay? Just forget about it as soon as it's over and go on your way. Okay, He's given us this day, first of all, to be a spiritual thermometer. Kind of tells us where we're at spiritually. Are we going to worship Him, okay? Um, if we don't, that tells us something about where we're at already, right? But if we come, it shows that we do love Him to some, you know, to some degree. But we do these things that He calls us to do as we meet together in order to inflame that love, to fan the flame, so to speak, okay? Because what do we do when we gather here? We worship Him. We adore Him. We pray. We seek Him. We hear His Word read. We hear it explained. And we receive the sacraments, uh, you know, the, the visible Word of God. And, of course, we meet with His people so that we might encourage one another to seek after the Lord. Okay? All these things are, again, meant to strengthen us that we might draw near to Him. So, again, if we draw near to Him in worship, if we're faithful in worshiping Him on the Lord's day, He draws near to us. But if we don't, He withdraws from us. It, it's really quite simple, isn't it? <laughs> draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. So the point is this, the more faithful we are in seeking Him, the more we draw near to Him, the nearer He will come to us and the stronger our love will be for Him. Now, if I were to ask you, what is it <clears throat> that characterized the life of Jesus? The life of maybe your favorite apostle, you know, who, who is that? John? Is it Paul? I think for most of us it's probably Paul or Peter because we can kind of relate to Peter. But what is it that characterized their lives? Or Luther or Calvin or Zwingli? I think I know more about Luther's devotion than I do Calvin's, oddly enough. We seem to focus a lot on Luther or Zwingli. But what about Jonathan Edwards? Okay? George Whitfield, Charles Spurgeon. And anyone else in the history of the church that the Lord used powerfully and mightily. Were these people used by the Lord in this way because they were just walking along one day and He just zapped them and boom, they started doing all these things? Or did they seek the Lord and draw near to Him? And because they did, and the Lord drew near to them, that He used them to do these things powerfully. Well, we know there was something to both, but we know that they did these things. They had to do these things. This is why they loved him so much, and this is why they were able to do so much, because they drew near to God. So the point is just this. If we would love him more, we must do the same. We have to draw near to him. There's no substitute. And if we will do this, I guarantee you, because the Bible guarantees it, I, I can't guarantee it, but the Bible guarantees it, you will love God more you will do more. But every single day, you're going to wrestle with this. Every single day, read, read Mortification of Sin by John Owen if you can get through that. Every day when you start to go in that direction, that corruption that's in us is going to make us go the other direction, and sadly, it often wins. And as it does, we grow weaker and weaker. That's why Paul says, yield to the Spirit. And you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. The Spirit of God is giving you those inclinations to go towards God. Go that direction. Listen to Him. Yield to Him. Obey Him. And then you will grow in your love for the Lord. We, we all will as we seek Him. Well, let's, let's bow in just a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to um, help us apply the things that we've heard this morning.